Hey, you know what I found out today? What? So obviously Expona was like over the weekend. Uh -huh. There's another trade show in Chicago that I don't want to say was would be better than Expona or anything like that, but I was really excited about it. There is a whole like coffee trade show in Chicago at the same time as like Expona. I just learned about it today. Just oh. learned about it. Oh yeah, that would definitely be better than Expona. <laughs> I'll go to that. <laughs> and you want, oh, and, and then the uh, Milan Furniture Show. Oh, say no more. Design show why, started why did, this week. I still, like, why are we even here? I don't. Why I don't, are we not there? I don't know. Oh, man. The images I'm seeing uh, out of Milan this morning, I'm just like, that's not fair. But guess who, <laughs> guess who uh, displayed at Milan? Who? Bringing it back to our industry. Dine Audio showcased a new collaboration uh, at Milan. Uh, oh, I just learned about it today. What was it? It's a it's a new speaker with some new finishes and stuff. They did it with a Japanese designer, but they unveiled it at Milan this week. And so I already sent off. I fired off an email. I'm like, I have to know about this because it is. It's not. I don't, okay, I wouldn't say the speaker is like super crazy, like unique, but uh -huh. it is, the finish is just. Mm. Mm. Dude, we could have totally written this trip off. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Next year. You want to know how to how to get us somewhere? <laughs> you want to know how to get us somewhere? Make us somewhere good. Yeah, make, like not that Chicago's not cool. Chicago's cool. Chicago's cool. Chicago's cool. It is cool. Yeah. But if Milan. I'm getting on a plane and yeah. dealing with all the hassle <laughs> that is travel, yeah, I I I want to go someplace that. I've never been before, like Milan. I have not been. I have been yeah. to Italy, but I have not been to Milan. Yeah, and I've, you know, I've never been to Milan either. I, so. I want. I want like the time where I'm not stuck inside a trade show. Like mm. the other time to be amazing. Yeah. You know, like. I don't like know. if you're like Florida, I'm not going to Florida. No, no. Yeah, that's not enough. <laughs> that's not. That is. It's not that does happen. not scream. <laughs> have a great time. <laughs> Uh, anyway, anyway, we should move on because <laughs> I can all, the hole we just keep digging for ourselves. <laughs> We're building Fallout shelter. <laughs> oh my god, that show is so good. Yes, if you're if, not watching Fallout or haven't already watched it, like we have, uh, don't stop this video. But as soon as this <laughs> video is done, if you're at work, you're at your lunch break or something. You're coming down with something, and you need to go home, <laughs> and you need to watch Fallout. Anyway, the Denon. The Denon. The Denon. The A1H. The A1H yes. that we just reviewed. Yeah. A pretty pretty beefy uh, home theater receiver. Yeah. They really like it, but, you know. <laughs> they, they, yeah. They're charging $6,500 for that, that baby. Yep. And you know what? Uh, I, there seems to be a little bit of confusion about who this receiver's for. I mean, okay. I know our setup mm -hmm. can't take advantage of all the 15 channels. Are there a lot of 15 channel receivers on the market? No, I think if I'm remembering correctly, when it was released, I believe the A1H is the first. That was kind of their, one of the things they hung their hat on. Well, that leads me to our first, the first part of our conversation. Okay. Francis Co <laughs> Cotenti. Oh, I think I nailed that. All right. Uh, 15 channels are way too many. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong, but for, for most users, without a true dedicated home theater room, the A1H is just too much. Okay. But before you answer, C Cass Monkeys <laughs> has, gives their own personal reason for okay. buying the den, and they own the A1H. They A own the A1H. Yes, they okay. Have it. All right. It says, I have one of these delicious babies. Okay. I just want to highlight that the reason I took out the credit card for this receiver was the different modes you could switch between. For example, Dolby Atmos, DTSX, Pro, IMAX, etc. Switching on and off the different speakers, mm -hmm. 9.4.8 configurations. Now, one of the things that the Denon and a lot of these more channel receivers offer though is assignability. So while you may sit there and go, my home theater doesn't have 15 speakers, the extra channels can be routed to do like biamping on your main channels. Um, you can use them for other speakers or zones. If you have say in walls, 
uh, an in ceilings for your home theater package, but then you have a pair of like, you know, really nice towers or bookshelves that you prefer to listen to stereo source material in, and those are out in your room. The extra channels can be tailored to sort of fit uh, different setup needs. It's not necessarily that you, that everyone is gonna have, say, 15 speakers and four subwoofers just for home theater. Okay, well, I wanna go back to stereo listening. You brought that up just a mm -hmm. second ago. Okay. Um, Master of Puppets okay. uh, says, would this AVR be good enough for stereo music listening, mm -hmm. or is extra hardware like an amp or a streamer, uh, say a Wim Pro, mm -hmm. needed for the best results? It really is gonna depend kind of on you and your equipment. Like for example, when I was, when, when, I, when we first got the A1H, the, the B&W 801 signatures arrived maybe a couple weeks later. And I was just so eager to like hear them uh, that I just connected them to the Denon. And for like a day and a half, two days, the Denon was the only thing kind of driving the, the B&Ws. And you know, it was fine. It was fine, but it was only when I came back uh, two days after just letting things play and I brought some other amplifiers and I connected those to the preamp out to the Denon and, and then used those amps to drive the B&Ws, I was like, oh, okay, there it is. Like, there is an improvement there. But when I switched to other speakers like Cornwall 4s or the Focals, for example, on the A1H, not as big of a difference, not as big of a delta. So you can get by with it. As far as streaming goes, this is really gonna come down to whether or not you like Heos. And there's just so much to cover about the Denon A1H that admittedly, I did not dive into Heos for you guys all that much. I used it and I mean, Heos just got an update and it is better. It's just not, it still doesn't react as a platform, the way that my brain works or the way I want things to work. Quality wise, like sound quality wise, I don't think Heos is necessarily bad. I think it fits or slides into just a giant swath of options, right? Do you need to add something like an Ever Solo or a mini or a, a Whim? I don't, I don't think so, but if you find yourself like, oh, I just don't like Heos, you would be doing it for the usability user experience, not so much for like, oh my God, the sound quality is just way better. Eh, I would hesitate, you know, when, if people start making those types of claims. Let's move on to the Denon A1H's video processing. Okay. Ed Uwadia okay. wants to know if your concerns about the Denon's video processing are unique to the A1H. I discovered the issues with Denon's video processing by accident. Did I notice them on Morant's products? I didn't because I didn't stumble upon them. I found them while I was troubleshooting and trying to figure out why. When employing a phantom center, uh, the Denon just didn't seem to be as refined, as good, as clear um, as every other AVR we had in house. And so, when I realized all my speaker settings were right, all my crossovers, everything was right, just no center channel, I started going into all the other menus. You know, because sometimes there'll be a setting in like the audio menu, which is separate from the speaker menu, and so on and so forth. And even now with HDMI and video, like sometimes you'll find some sort of weird audio thing in the video section. And so I was just checking every little thing that I had, and that's when I noticed like uh, the upscaler and mode things were all off and I realized like, oh, I haven't turned those on, let's see what's going on. And uh, I had our Dune player connected and I had Batman or Dark Knight on and it was the Bane fight and I activated it and oh my God, like that scene is already dark. That scene is already dark when Bane and Batman are fighting, but it just clamped down and it became unwatchable, it was so dark. I can't say if you're gonna run into the same thing with some of the Morantz products or other Denons because honestly, this is not something that I have run up against or thought to test. Um, because I always let our TVs do the processing. Uh, and that's just kind of how I've done it since the beginning of time. And now that like we use Sony TVs in this house as our reference and they're so good in that regard, like there's not a receiver on the market that's gonna out process what like say a Sony XR processor can do. 
So I, I still stand by my recommendation, like leave those processing settings off. Just let the, the Denon switch uh, using its HDMI inputs. You did bring up our next uh, topic, the oh. Phantom Center oh, okay. problem. Okay. Um, at 88 says, I'm disappointed that the A1H doesn't play well with a Phantom Center setup. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced this, defi this deficiency in any other Denon Marantz receiver receivers of recent years? So this is something that Christy and I are really starting to drill down and and get to the bottom of. And I don't want to say rank receivers based on how good they do or what, but we've definitely put more of an emphasis on it in the last couple of months than we have maybe in the past. And so knowing that and coming off of the Onkyo 3100, which is not comparable, it's not, it's not going to upset the Denon, but knowing that that was our last receiver and we use many of the same speakers, and I don't, I don't recall that jumping out to me the way that when we did the den and I did my Phantom Center testing, I was like, oh, where did it go? Like it's, it's like the center image is still there, but it's just like way, way back. I don't experience that on our 7000 ES, um, and we were just watch, we we're just using it the other night, um, and even this uh, new receiver we have, I don't know if I'm going to experience. It on that either so it may just be like i said i don't know if it's denon if it's dolby if it's something with their processing maybe it can be fixed in a firmware update if there is even something to be fixed i just i don't recall it being quite as noticeable well the good news babe yeah is that you only really missed one comparison i know what let's do the emma chamberlain <laughs> you know, scream. Yay! Uh, uh, anyhow, <laughs> uh, there were several people that were asking about Anthem receivers. Oh, um, right. Uh, m mostly about the MRX 1140, which we have not no, heard. No, we had the we, 740. Yeah. Okay. Um, so different. I know that you, maybe you can't a answer like that direct comparison, but okay. perhaps you can talk about the sound. Just going off the 740, I think the Anthem 11 whatever is probably going to sound really, really good. Uh, if they've fixed the fan issue, uh, which I understand there was a firmware update shortly after our 740 review that supposedly uh, fixed the, the fan speed. So I don't think fan noise should be an issue. So yeah, I would think that unless you're like super married to brand loyalty, like, you know, I've just been a Denon guy forever, or I really want Dirac and their bass control, could probably be a close to half price. Uh, uh, the 1140 is $4,200. Okay. And the 740 is uh, thirty about 3100 I think the 740 needs a price reduction. I think the 1140 is probably appropriately priced given the quality of Anthem, the design and everything like that. Um, yeah, I, I think I think they're gonna be comparable. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that even without room correction, the Anthem probably doesn't need a third party software to kind of come in and like firm it up, you know? Well, speaking save of the that, day. speaking of that, we mm -hmm. can kind of help us move on okay. to the next topic. Uh -huh. uh, I wanna talk about the different Room EQ platforms. Oh, yeah. As you just set, mentioned, Anthem's ARC, mm -hmm. there's Odyssey, there's Dirac. Yeah. You know, Sony has their own thing. Keeping with the Anthem conversation, at Steve Wright, 1539, mm -hmm. would like to know how does Dirac stack up to Anthem's ARC? I would say that prior to my experience with Dirac bass control, just the Dirac full suite, no bass control, and Anthem room correction. I would pick Anthem room correction over Dirac. I, I really like the results that Anthem room correction gives me. It's very reminiscent of what I would kind of do on my own. Now, Dirac adding on, which is an optional extra, adding on the bass control, that's a whole other like, oh my God, that's that's a level up. Okay, let's move on to Odyssey. Okay. 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 At CJT74 mm -hmm. says, if you ponied up for the Dirac license, why didn't you get the similar license for Odyssey's multi 
EQX for Windows. It's like having a mini DSP for all channels, except unlike the mini DSP, Odyssey's new software add-on doesn't limit you, doesn't limit your number of target curves. Correct. And or EQ filters. Correct. He's absolutely correct. When it comes to software and user interfaces, everyone's going to be a little bit different. I personally don't find Odyssey's add-on app for Windows to be all that intuitive. It's definitely not as intuitive as what they have put into pretty much every receiver on the market today, where you're plugging a mic in that walks you through the steps on your television, and then it asks you a couple of basic questions. In that regard, Odyssey has basically set the standard for kind of how every other room correction software um, interacts with the customer. And for that, they should be applauded. They really should. Because my experience with Odyssey dates all the way back to when it was in a separate box that went between components. And it was a whole thing. And it was cool as hell back then. And I paid for it. I, I, I think my Odyssey Pro installer kit was like four grand. And I loved it. But the rest of the world has now caught up and in some instances surpassed. And I just, I have it. I don't enjoy using it. But I fully understand there might be people that are like, I tried direct. It sucks. I got my money back. I'm Odyssey for life. I get it. I get it. But this is an iPhone, Android kind of conversation. It's like, just what, what do you prefer? So at Raphael Franco mm -hmm. says, if, if, if Direct makes such a huge difference, then do I need this receiver or will any receiver with Direct be the same? Yeah, I saw that question. It stands to reason that any receiver that is going to enable you to experience the full suite of Dirac products, including base management, whether it be single or multi-sub, you should have some degree of improvement that falls somewhat in line with what I'm describing. Where it may come up short or where you may feel like, oh, it's not exactly how I think he's describing it, is going to come down to you can't disregard, I know some people are like, is this a direct review or is this a Denon review? You can't disregard that the Denon A1H started from a really solid platform in that the amplifiers are incredibly well built. There's a lot of headroom. The amplifier structure itself is way, way, way better than what you're going to find in an $800 receiver. So we're starting with a really great engine already. And then we're tuning it for maximum output. Well, that leads me to the last segment, okay. which is the licensing ah. concerns. Because <laughs> look, I mean, like the last question about, yeah. could I basically, can I just buy the upgraded Dirac and put it on whatever receiver yeah. I have? The The risk there is that the Per, to purchase the Dirac license mm -hmm. to test this out on maybe whatever you already own, you know, that's A, it's expensive, yeah. and B, you will only work on that one receiver. Yeah. So if you do that and you're like, oh, this still, this still doesn't wow me, mm -hmm. and then you, you're like, well, I guess I have to upgrade, <laughs> and whenever you're able to do that, like you're just, it's yeah. hard to get off the hamster wheel. Yeah. Um, and I know there were a lot of opinions, a lot of people that agreed with you, uh, with your displeasure that Denon did not include at least like basic Dirac. Yeah. You know, Unstable Network says your feelings of frustration over Dirac being a license and not as a service is understandable. If the full bundle was included in a higher priced unit, no one would have noticed. Mm -hmm. You know, Mike Stewart. 2912 says that's crazy that Dirac isn't transferable. I have Dirac from my NAD update was in, and I was hoping to use it on my Cinema 40, which yeah. you know, sorry, that's yeah. not going to be possible. <laughs> um, there was actually somebody else that was sort of alluded to. Well, maybe they will go to a subscription-based service similar to what Adobe did, because now you don't own your software. No, you just pay. You, you're nine, renting it. Nineteen, twenty-nine, thirty. I mean, yeah, you never so, own it. Which is worse? I, I don't think audio files are going to stand for any of it. Well, I can say as a reviewer, 
like I would welcome a, a subscription model from Dirac because it was infuriating to th to realize that um, it wasn't transferable because the first thing I did when you know A1H is here, I, I pull up my laptop, uh, launch the Dirac app on my on my uh, Mac. It sees the A1H, sees it clear as day like that. Didn't have to do anything. Oh yeah, of course I want to calibrate it. Click, pop up window. You don't have a license for this, and I'm like the hell I don't. I have many a license. Then you log in and you realize, oh no, it it. I have to buy another one. It's incredibly frustrating, um, especially knowing that there was no way I was going to be able to talk to you guys about a product as high priced as this without attempting to go as far into the Dirac uh, ecosystem as possible with that new base management and stuff. So yeah, um, six forty nine on top of sixty five hundred dollars is a oof, it's a hard pill to swallow. But I don't know what the answer is because I'm kind of like you. Like I do think the vast majority of this hobby is going to go to some sort of an Adobe-esque subscription. And I'm with you. Like, I hated having to pay four to 600 or 700 or sometimes even $1,100 every six to 18 months with Adobe. So at first, I was kind of like, I can get all the Adobe software for $9.99. Oh, yes, please. But then it only took like two years of getting everyone on the 999 package before you started getting emails where it's like, hey, really sorry, but we got to like really raise the price. Well, see, this is why I think you, you want to buy a product for what it's going to do for you out of the box. 100% agree. Uh, rather than it ha needing to rely on. I mean, cables, <laughs> another yeah. streamer. I mean, I know you look, I, don't at me, you separates are the <laughs> rule your world. I get it. We've all, we've all seen your comments. Yeah. This is not, this conversation isn't for you. Yeah. Uh, but I just think that this is why I like the Sony receivers yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, they're, just does it. They just, it just does it and it works really good. Yeah. I personally don't love Odyssey. Mm -hmm. um, Denon, Denon has is has never really had a sound that I gravitate towards. Okay. Um, feel free to disagree, <laughs> uh, but I will say that adding the Dirac bass management, mm -hmm. honestly, it made it sound like it did. It made it sound not like a Denon. Yeah. It like I said, I think it was. It had more of a Rotel Krell vibe in the just that control, that kick. Than and that anything. to me, that to me was great because yeah. I don't really like Denon sound. Mm -hmm. um, so that was like, heck yeah! I, <laughs> the, here's a Denon I would actually allow to stay in house. Yeah. But is it still a Denon? I don't know. You know, chicken yeah. or the egg. Yeah. So yeah. that's it. That's all of our time. Oh, okay. That's that's the last question. And everything. Yeah. I mean, I don't really think I need to go into anything else about my, what I think. I, all right. I just told you. <laughs> well, there you have it. Uh, what episode was this? Six. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. I forgot to welcome people. To, uh, welcome to episode six, six of Unplugged. Of Unplugged. Huh. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Right well, at the end. We, yeah. You know. We'll get you eventually. Yeah. So. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching uh, episode six. Uh, we're enjoying the hell out of this. I hope you can tell. Um, be sure to tune in on Sunday. Got a brand new video for you guys. Uh, we're going to be talking power amps, cheap power amps. So stay no, tuned. No, not cheap. But you, you well, just, and, and affordable. Just keep digging your affordable, hole. Affordable. Just keep digging. Yeah. Affordable. Not, it's, it, we affordable. can't even use those all adjectives. Right, all right. <laughs> anyway, be sure to tune in Sunday. Until next time, thank you so much, guys, for watching. And uh, have a good rest of your day. Bye.